so it can be used for adult arthroplasty and um, alignment uh, planning and preparation for uh, knee arthroplasty as well and post-trauma cases. So in terms of the um, way forward, uh, the way I approach this, there's uh, I just go through uh, the basic malalignment test and mechanical axis and then go through individual segments and then if there are uh, deformities within each segment you can then break those down individually and then of course uh, the more complex ones where there's rotational deformities and a bit of all of the above. Key to this is getting good quality imaging so that you can make assessments and the standard uh, that's been used for a long time is this standing uh, AP x-ray from about 10 feet and, and these images are all uh, taken from the um, resource that was available. I did the Baltimore limb lengthening uh, and limb deformity back in 2004. And um, I don't think these images, um, I think they are still available, obviously. And um, I've found them useful just as a, a resource to use for consistency as much as anything else. There are other um, imaging techniques available. We have an EOS scanner, which is a biplanar X-ray scanner, uh, which gives us AP and lateral views at the same time, um, which is increasingly we are using for our mechanical axis views. But key to planning really is to have a standardized uh, image, which is a um, centered over the knee, but you've got to make sure ideally that your patella is facing forward and is consistently uh, in that position so that you can uh, assess rotation and the alignment in a consistent manner. So in terms of the, the first, uh, you're presented with this uh, uh, x-ray. The first thing you want to know is, is this a varus? Is there a valgus here? And, and this uh, would be initially uh, drawn as a line uh, from the center of the femoral head down to the center of the ankle. Now in the normal aligned limb, uh, this would normally go through somewhere in the middle or just inside uh, the medial side of the middle of the knee. So clearly this is a varus. And then you would um, need to uh, include a scalar ball of known diameter so that you can uh, use that as a uh, change or a ratio uh, for any measurements. In terms of the nomenclature, then there are small, uh, sort of lower and uppercase um, letters used for uh, the various uh, descriptions of the angles that we use. And they follow a fairly uh, consistent approach, uh, being uh, mechanical, uh, anatomic, uh, median lateral being uppercase and then with the proximal distal and then angles being uppercase as well. And what that uh, effectively means that uh, you can describe a mechanical a lateral distal femoral angle as the MLDFA and then similarly you can do a, an anatomical medial proximal femoral angle and finally but just final example you can do the um, anatomic anterior distal tibial angle as the AADTA. A lot of the time we're going to be using mechanical axes, but the anatomic and mechanical axes are not, are not the same necessarily in the femur and the tibia. This is probably one of the most important slides. This just gives an example, uh, an idea of what you would expect your normal alignment to be in a mechanical axis view. And the axis of, uh, from the center of the femoral head down to the center of the ankle, uh, passing through the center of the knee. This assumes that there's no problems within the knee joint though. And this is something you need to be aware of when you're actually looking at these x-rays. The anatomic angles are different in the femur the tibia, the anatomic and the mechanical axis are fairly similar, but I think typically they say it's, it's around two millimeters different, but they are parallel. So to all intents and purposes, they're used as uh, fairly similar. 
So in terms of uh, the process, uh, the first thing you want to know whether, is whether or not there is a leg length discrepancy. And this typically would actually be from the superior aspect of the acetabulum, again down to the ankle, and then you can look at the differences between the two. You can then look at the individual segments to see whether or not there are uh, differences in the lengths of the femurs and the tibias, and that will give you an indication as to what the length discrepancies are in each individual uh, segment. And then obviously you do the same on the other side. The mechanical axis deviation just gives you an idea of the uh, changes and the deviation of, of the uh, malalignment. And this will show you from the medial uh, eminences to the uh, mechanical axis line how much deviation you have. And this is a principle that's used quite often in a guided growth just to assess how much change and improvement you, you are uh, obtaining during the uh, course of treatment. So once you've looked at the malalignment uh, test, you've also just got to try and make sure that there's no uh, problems within the knee joint as well, with the subluxation or whether the knee joint itself is uh, actually open or closed if you've got laxity or damage to the individual uh, joints. Uh, the individual segments can then be analysed to see where actually the varus or valgus is occurring. And taking us back to that uh, main uh, alignment uh, slide, uh, the mechanical uh, femoral, uh, lateral distal femoral angle is usually around 87, 88 degrees or therefore thereabouts. So anything uh, less than that would be a valgus, anything more than that would be varus. Tibia, typically it's uh, about 88 degrees or almost 90 uh, give or take and that uh, would be passing the act the axis would pass directly down the center of the tibia in the normal instance but as i mentioned before just be careful that you look at the joint itself because the the joint uh, congruency uh, can actually be uh, non-parallel and you just need to be aware of that because that can uh, introduce intra-articular changes to the overall alignment. Also be careful that there's no translation of the femur and tibia relative to each other. When you have changes within the actual articular surfaces themselves, uh, we quite often see this post meningitis and um, you can see uh, that the condyl, condyles are not necessarily parallel and they can uh, also with, in terms of blounts and other conditions, they are not uh, going to be similar and you need to take this into account when you're doing your individual segment analysis in terms of what you're going to correct. So if we just look at a um, individual uni apical deformity, we would uh, typically draw our reference lines across the joints, proximally and distally, and then draw your axes that would be seen in the normal bone. And where they intersect would be the cora or the center of rotation of angulation. And this will be the point around which you need to uh, move or make the osteotomy in order to uh, straighten and correct the malalignment. That uh, intersection can be bisected and the, um, there are various concepts uh, around this. Most of the time uh, the uh, rule one osteotomy where you actually pass through uh, the angulation and the um, bisector line, you won't get any translation. When you start deviating from the bisector line, uh, moving proximally or distally, or uh, off the bisector, moving it away, you will introduce translation or and uh, rota rotate. You can put your hinge point anywhere on the bisector line 
and it will actually give you a corrected alignment at the end of your uh, procedure and you can set it so you can either have an opening or closing wedge depending on whether you want length or not as part of your correction. But if you start moving your hinge point away, you can uh, introduce a translation and you can use this almost usually in a reverse way in order to correct what you actually want to achieve uh, depending on the malalignment or the uh, deformities that you have presented to you. So for example, with this case, we've done the mechanical axis uh, uh, align, uh, view. It shows that there's a deviation of medial varus we then want to say, well, whereabouts is that occurring? So if we do our segmental analysis of, of the femur, that's look, measured at 71 degrees. So there's a significant valgus within the femur. However, overall, there's a varus in the entire uh, lower limb. So we then need to carry on and actually just check the um, tibia as well. So we draw reference lines and draw the normal axis line that you would expect in the proximal tibia. Go down to the ankle and then draw the normal axis reference line. And that crosses outside the tibia. Now, if you wanted to, you could draw your bisector line through that, osteotomize the tibia. And if you corrected around that bisector line, you would get a mechanical axis of the tibia such that the ankle and the knee joint are parallel and it, they would be aligned in terms of the joints, but you would have a very Z-shaped tibia in the middle. So clearly we can't really do that because we want the mechanical, we want the axis, mechanical and anatomic axis from the knee joint down to the ankle joint to go through the bone at all times. So what we then do is find a point on those axes lines where they are about in the middle of the medullary cavity of that bone. And we draw that line down through the bone. And where we join the axes lines with that middle line, that gives us a biplanar correction that's necessary. So you can then have two separate osteotomies which will then correct the overall malalignment and straighten that individual tibia. So this is just uh, going back to the first rule, just giving an idea that we've drawn our bisector line and by correcting on that, we straighten and correct the tibia. Uh, if we move away on the bisector line, then we introduce an amount of lengthening, but we still correct and don't translate that tibial deformity so that we maintain the overall axis and the alignment. But with this multi-apical deformity, if we did our hinge point, we could straighten and make our ankle and tibial alignment of the joints parallel but we would have this very abnormal and bent tibia at the end of that procedure. So what we then have to do is actually go and uh, look at this in a different way. We draw that bisector line down the middle and then we do a proximal osteotomy and we correct the proximal amount, uh, alignment so that we get the axis from the center of the knee down the tibia. However, we still don't have a properly aligned ankle joint compared to the knee joint. So then we go down to our lower end and do the same again and correct that. At the end of those two procedures, proximally and distally, we will have a corrected tibial mechanical axis, but we will also have 
both the ankle and the tibia parallel. This is just one example of using these principles. And uh, this was a hip replacement that was put in a little bit uh, too tight and incorrectly. If we look at the uh, axis and work out the neck shaft angle, that angle there was should be 90 degrees. It was put in a bit long so that the uh, proximal uh, angle is uh, too great it's about nine or ten degrees too high and this probably had something to do with the fact that this hip then dislocated because it was a bit too tight and long and this is really an example to show that you don't have to use these principles just for um, pediatric cases just be aware of the proper planning that you can use and then arrange for the, uh, you can then uh, correct them uh, using the same principles. You don't have to use fixators, you can do acute corrections in the femur, but again, the same principles apply. This is just um, something I, that I've just, I keep going on about. When you um, look at an x-ray, you just need to be aware that it is a two-dimensional picture of a three-dimensional object. And by rotating the individual bone, you can project an image of either it looking completely straight or the uh, malalignment as you can see. So this is why it's so important to have standardized images and if I can just show that this, if you imagine this is a neck shaft angle, if you externally rotated the femur, you could have a measured neck shaft angle of anywhere between 135 and 180 degrees, all just depending on the rotation of the individual of that femoral segment. I realize this is just a little multi-tool just showing the basic principle but just be aware of the rotational projection of your bone on the x-ray when you're actually analyzing these images. There are other, lots of other things that in terms of oblique plane uh, deformities um, that uh, we can go through, but I think in terms of time, that those are the basic principles that I would suggest in terms of the mechanical axis deviation and the individual segmental analysis and then the basics of the osteotomies and uh, the corrections 